Good afternoon and welcome to Ames Brown Bag uh, Lunch Webinar. So one of the things I thought it would be interesting to look at, and this is a, a bit of a riff on what we've done before with respect to the uh, economic picture in the Commonwealth, I thought I would take a look at a tale of the tape in terms of performance for the Patrick administration going back to January of 2007. Uh, and taking a look at where things stood then and where they stand now. And then a look to the beginning of the 188th legislative session, uh, which ended at the end of July, or the formal portions of it ended, hence the uh, third column there, or the fourth column that says June 14th, end of the 188th session, almost. Uh, and then a, a final column, which uh, I guess will be filled in sometime in January or February, perhaps even March. Now you can see that the unemployment picture at the beginning of the governor's administration was not bad. And then 2008 hit everyone, um, almost a 7% uh, unemployment rate. But in the last several months, that picture has turned around dramatically, and it looks like the unemployment rate is trending in the right direction. Closely following that is the business confidence index. You can see that in January of 07, the confidence was negative, uh, turned just slightly positive at the beginning of the session, and now we are solidly uh, in positive territory, and our members have a very good feeling, it appears, about where they are as companies, uh, where the Commonwealth is as a whole. The hiring picture is brightening. Even the national index, which for those of you who've been on this call before, you know the national business confidence index of our members, at least, how they, portray, how they feel about the conditions at the national level, that indicator has been the lagging one for the duration of this uh, recession. And just in the last month or two, it started to get close to 50. In the last month, it actually uh, was in positive territory for the first time in a long time. So that's kind of the good news. I think with respect to uh, news that's maybe mixed, uh, the uh, number of folks in the non-farm employment sector uh, 3.3 million uh, at the beginning of the Patrick administration fell to uh, 3.25 in January, and then back just slightly over 3.3. So the non-farm employment rate is, is relatively the same as it was at the beginning of the administration. It's actually been pretty steady uh, for the last several years, actually. And then the non-farm civilian workforce, this is everybody uh, except for folks in the military, you can see that that's grown by just, just eh, I don't know, less than 100,000. Um, and that's obviously the folks who are in the public sector as well as the private sector workforce. The piece that I wanted to call your attention to, and I actually saw some polling data this morning that shows that Massachusetts is not alone in this uh, statistic, is the workforce participation rate, or sometimes referred to as the labor participation rate. This is the number of able-bodied individuals who should be working uh, who are. And you can see that at the beginning of the administration, we had about 67% workforce participation. And that's now at 64.4. What's troubling about that and the data that I saw this morning is that trend is reflected worldwide, where the labor participation rate uh, is quite low across the globe. And I'm not quite sure that I'm prepared to draw any conclusions from that other than things that I think we all know, which is we're all doing more with less. Technology allows for a tremendous amount of productivity and output without a lot of labor input. And so as a consequence, you see the labor participation rate starting to fall. Things in Massachusetts that I think might affect that would include uh, a very high minimum wage. As you all know, AIM thought that that was not a very good idea. And of course, the whole migration of uh, manufacturing into high technology and uh, the greater use of technology across all sectors, which will have an effect on, on labor. So as we move forward in the years ahead, I think that's something that everyone needs to be concerned about. And clearly, the folks who are participating in the labor force, uh, there's the group that are highly educated and highly skilled, and the folks at the very low end, I think it's the middle that's hollowing out, and I think there are concerns there for all of us. And in terms of state budget, and this is a bit of a challenging number to pin down because everybody uses a different set of numbers, but you can see that by the general, uh, the 
house one uh, uh, numbers, we are trending from 31, uh, almost 32 billion at the beginning of the administration, up to just above 40 billion uh, right now. So, a pretty steady growth in state spending, and most of that, I'm sure, tied to health care. Speaking of budgets, just want to mention one thing in the FY15 budget that, that we wanted to call to everyone's attention. There was a commission established uh, to study the medical device tax that's part of the Affordable Care Act. Again, as you all know, AIM has been very active in terms of its work on issues relative to the Affordable Care Act and their adverse impacts on Massachusetts. We think this is another adverse impact, uh, the imposition of a medical device tax on one of the sectors of our economy uh, that's doing quite well and is quite robust. And we think uh, a tax on that sector is not a wise idea. The commission is being formed to try to figure out if there's a way for Massachusetts, using its tax policy, if there's a way to offset the negative impacts of the federal tax imposed by ACA. And we'll keep you informed uh, as that unfolds. Uh, on the jobs bill, and this uh, ironically remains the one item that is uh, to be finalized by the governor. Uh, we expect that sometime in the next 24 hours there'll be an announcement about uh, a bill signing. I believe the governor has until uh, the 14th to decide what to do with that bill. As a, just a top-line reminder, we were quite concerned about the um, issue of non-competes. The Senate included language that, as I described in the last webinar, we thought was quite harmful to the intellectual property of our members. Uh, fortunately, the final conference committee report did not include language relative to non-compete agreements. And for that, we are very grateful. It also didn't include language regarding the uh, Non-Uniform Trade Secrets Act. Uh, what it did include, however, was a change to the R&D tax credit, uh, which we supported and which we believe uh, will help stimulate additional private sector research and development investment here in Massachusetts. And we are uh, hopeful that the governor will sign that. We, we've been hearing uh, largely positive uh, responses to our inquiries or to our lobbying efforts around signing that particular provision. Uh, I believe at this point uh, the matter comes down to uh, whether or not ANF believes the impact um, is justified in terms of the economic activity that might be generated. Uh, and hopefully their recommendation to the governor is that he sign that. Uh, and we'll obviously let folks know once we know. A couple of other matters which we were following quite uh, aggressively at the end of the session. Uh, there were two major energy bills, one having to do with net metering or solar, and the other uh, relative to the so-called green energy bill. Uh, fortunately, from our perspective, neither bill moved in the form in which it was drafted, uh, and we thank the legislature for taking a much more deliberative approach. The net metering bill was uh, slimmed down, I'll get to that in a second, uh, and most importantly called for a study of the whole uh, renewable energy uh, environment, particularly as it relates to uh, solar energy. Uh, our objection to the net metering bill was principally related to the costs. Uh, we already have extremely high electricity costs here in Massachusetts, and our fear was that the additional uh, solar capacity that the bill called for would have raised electricity rates by about $1.5 billion over the next 15 years. Much of the feedback we got on that was from our larger commercial and industrial rate payers who are already paying twice what their competitors are paying for electricity. And the fear was that this additional obligation over and above what they're already required to pay would have made Massachusetts that much less competitive. And that was our concern with that bill. As a result of our lobbying efforts, the legislature uh, modestly increased the current program. The problem with the current program was the subsidies are so generous that the program basically ran out of uh, capacity. Uh, the, the net metering was capped at 3% in both the private and in the public marketplace. And once 3% of capacity was reached, there was no longer uh, the level of subsidy that had been provided prior. What the legislature did was rather than 
just completely uncapped the program. They raised the cap for private installations by 1% and for public installations by 2%. The, at this point, it appears that we'll be bumping up against the cap sometime in the first or second quarter of 2015. And so we'll be back to discuss this with all the parties of interest and the new administration uh, to try to design a program that is more cost effective for our members. And to that end, is a task force established in the legislation which is required to report on the cost benefit analysis of the program. Uh, and it specifically references folks who are uh, non-participating ratepayers. These are the people who have who don't have the ability to install solar either because of their location or for other reasons. And they end up being net payers to pay for the very generous subsidies provided for in the program. And so there'll be a commission formed, aims a full member. Uh, meetings will start in October and report due by March. I think the March date is deliberate. If our information is correct about when the cap expires or when the, the cap starts to become an issue again for a second quarter, uh, there'll need to be some legislative solution, at least on the table, so that as the cap starts to become a problem, we have an answer to what to do going forward. Some other issues that moved at the end of the session, uh, domestic violence leave bill, which was signed, I think, last Friday, uh, a substance abuse bill, uh, an IT bond bill, water infrastructure, and a couple of others, campaign finance reform among them. Um, in terms of the end of the session, I jumped off that slide too quickly. Um, as, as you probably know, since you're all observers of this uh, process, that uh, the legislature really did leave an awful lot to be done in the final two or three days of the legislative session. So things were flying back and forth. Uh, one of the reasons the jobs bill um, has gone so long is the paperwork didn't arrive on the governor's desk until a couple of days after the session was over. Uh, and it's just the the sheer processing of all the documents that took as long as it did. So uh, that's why that bill isn't signed and why our prediction that everything would be done by this date uh, turned out to be false. And at the end, I'll leave time for questions. So I, I want, I'm just going to try to cover as much of the waterfront as I can, and then we'll uh, address questions when we get to the end. In terms of uh, next session, I, I think one of the natural things that we do here is once the session is over, we start thinking about the next round. Uh, clearly expect with the new administration there will be a, a full and, and probably lengthy discussion about tax policy. There will certainly be a conversation about where the Commonwealth is going and where it should go with respect to energy policy. Healthcare will continue to be a top level concern uh, for all the reasons that you're all familiar with. And then other legislation that we're always worried about, HR, labor law in particular. And if you look at the list of bills that are at least begun at the bullet here under the HR labor law items, now these are all items that we've seen before in prior sessions. Uh, none of them passed this session. And I think we can all fully expect to see them again next session. Uh, the problem, I think, with, with some of the folks who push these things as they, they never rest, and so therefore we're always in a position of having to uh, uh, defend against these proposals and make sure that uh, we don't let up because uh, the other side doesn't let up uh, in any way, shape, or form. In terms of uh, issues on the horizon, I, I would remind everyone that uh, we are in informal sessions, which should not be confused with nothing happens during informal sessions. Uh, there are times when very significant legislative matters do make it through the process. We will obviously watch that. At the moment, I think we're in the, the quiet period. We don't expect that there'll be much happening in August or September. But come October, and certainly after the election is over in November, it's a time for increased vigilance because legislative matters can advance. Uh, with unanimous consent, and sometimes that is achieved, and, and we just need to be aware of that. Um, the project that we're engaged in right now is coming up with the AIM legislative scorecard. Uh, we'll have more for you on that 
in a couple of weeks. The other thing that we're watching is uh, looking at the various regulations that would flow from any of the legislative items that were adopted at the end of the session. And then from an electoral perspective, just want to remind everybody the primary is a month from today, or four weeks from today, September 9th. The ads are starting to fly. I'm sure the uh, your mailboxes are full, and if they're not full, they will be shortly. And then the ballot uh, for November is also right around the corner. That includes both the final election and the four ballot questions, which we have uh, discussed before. But just to remind you, uh, the unchaining of the gas tax increase from inflation is the first question. Uh, the bottle bill expansion bill is the second. Repealing the legalization of casino gambling is the third question. And the fourth question is the earned sick time. And again, just as a matter of record, the AIM Board of Directors has voted to oppose all four of the questions and uh, recommends to the members that they vote no. And here's the part that I wanted to get to uh, in terms of the begging part of the program. As you all know, AIM is turning 100 uh, next year. Uh, we're trying to celebrate that milestone appropriately. And I think what we're hoping to do is take a moment to look at the past and, and all of the companies and the, uh, the policies and the things that we've been able to accomplish in the last 100 years. But more importantly, we want to take an opportunity to really hear from our members about where we should go going forward and at the risk of setting too high a goal for ourselves, we've opted to refer to this as the blueprint for the next century. And what we hope to do is gather input from all of our members from across the Commonwealth, from folks who are not members, from folks from academia. We're looking for input from members of the labor community. And just really want to spend some time talking to a wide cross-section of members, uh, citizens in the Commonwealth and businesses to find out where to from here. One way to participate if you're not able to attend any of the, event, the events is to take the survey and we'll send the slides out to everyone who's on the call as soon as this is over. Uh, there's a link right here where it says take the survey. I'll admit it's a little bit long. It's not a survey where you just click the buttons and move on. But the reason for that is we wanted to make sure that you felt completely free to give whatever input that you felt was necessary, and that there was no sense of uh, us leading the witness or us uh, suggesting answers to you even subliminally. And we wanted to be sure that you had the opportunity to answer the questions uh, as you saw fit. So uh, with that, I will finish and entertain any questions that folks might have about the material that I have arguably raced through pretty quickly. Let me just get the question thing up here. Hold on. So there's a qu the first question here is, does the governor have the ability to line item veto the jobs bill? Yes, uh, the jobs bill that's on the governor's desk is a spending bill. And as such, the governor retains the right to line item veto, as well as send sections of that bill back with recommended amendments. Of course, I think the net result of that, if, if that were the decision, is that the uh, proposed amendments wouldn't go any further and the matter would die. But yes, the governor does have that ability. Uh, there's a question here, why does AIM oppose the five cent bottle bill ballot question? I think there are two principal reasons. One, our board believes very strongly that there's a better way to establish uh, single source recycling at the community level. Uh, and secondly, as we know from the original bottle bill, most of the money that comes out of that five cent bottle deposit ends up being diverted to other purposes and it basically becomes an alternative form of taxation. So it's not, in our opinion, it's not an environmental bill as much as it is a spending bill. And we think there's a better way to get a higher rate of recycling uh, in the Commonwealth and to expand the bottle deposit law. And that's why our board 
uh, oppose the bottle bill question. Are there any other uh, any other questions? How? Oh, <laughs> Some, uh, someone who's a former Senate insider asked a question as to how do we get a picture of the Senate uh, chamber. I can't tell. And then uh, someone just asked about a list of the upcoming listening sessions and how can we find out about those. Actually, the next slide has a full list of those, and I'll, I'll jump to that in a moment. And I'll jump to it right now. As you can see, it's a pretty aggressive uh, schedule, both in terms of dates and locations. Uh, where we know who the sponsors are, we have their logos. I guess now we have them all. Um, and we're starting off right after Labor Day in West Springfield. And then there are, I don't know, eight events all over the Commonwealth. So hopefully folks will have the opportunity to attend one or more uh, of these events. They're all starting at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And they go until 6. The um, latter part of the program, I believe, involves beer and wine. So for those of you who might be tempted by that offer, uh, I throw that out there as well. Um, and, and what scares, I, I'll share something personal with you about this because I'm going to be the person conducting each of these events. Um, I, I really do want it to be an opportunity for us to listen to you. So it will be one of those meetings where I'll provide the background and then I'm going to stop talking. And if you've ever done any public speaking, you'll know that's a pretty scary moment when you're waiting for the first person to talk. So um, hopefully um, people will come and feel free to share with us their thoughts about where the Commonwealth should go going forward. Uh, another question, why is AIM opposed to earn sick time? AIM is not opposed to earn sick time. Uh, AIM is in favor of letting companies make their own decisions about what their benefit packages should be. It could be sick time, it could be earned time, it could be vacation, it could be personal. We think companies are so smart that they can figure that out on their own. They don't need some nincompoop from the legislature telling them what they need to do for HR policy. Um, I hope that answers that question. Any other uh, are there any other questions from the audience? As usual, I thought I wasn't going to get through this quickly, but I managed to babble my way through in 25 minutes. I think that might be a new record. A couple of other quick uh, dates that you might want to be aware of. Uh, in terms of the centennial, as I said, we're 100 years old next year. May 8th is the centennial annual meeting. There will be summer conferences in the summer of 2015. And then believe it or not, we have the date for our big 100th uh, celebration event. That's November 16th. And it will be at the Boston Convention Center. Uh, so that should be a fun uh, that should be a fun night. Hopefully everyone has an opportunity to attend that. And then lastly, uh, just want to remind folks our September executive forums coming up. We have uh, David Paleologos. Uh, given the timing, that should be perfect. It'll be right after the primary and far enough in front of the general election that there might be some interesting data to share. He'll also update us on what's happening in the national races and, of course, the big races to watch include the various uh, uh, Senate contests to see if the Senate, uh, the control of the Senate will switch from the Democrat Party to the Republican Party, and hopefully David will have a chance to explain some of that to us as well. Uh, with that, and again, being respectful of your time, uh, I will end. We'll send the uh, slides out to everyone who registered for this. And if you have any questions at all, or if you need to, uh, if you need further clarification on anything that we discussed today, uh, please feel free to call me uh, at the number on the slide or shoot me an email, and I'd be happy to answer your questions. Um, so again, thank you very much for attending. Thank you for your membership and aim, and uh, feel free to call me about anything. Uh, that might be on your mind going forward.